Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, from wherever you're joining us, and welcome to today's virtual demo, a technical overview of animal warming. Our speaker for today is Dr. Kathy Garner, a technical resource scientist at Kent Scientific, where she focuses on helping researchers utilize Kent Scientific's products to optimize their own experiments. Before I welcome Kathy to the floor, I wanted to cover a few housekeeping notes to help you all get the most out of your experience today. First, you can take a look at the interactivity panel at the right of your screen with four tabs, chat, Q&A, polls, and handouts. We want this to be an interactive experience for you, so please send your questions, thoughts, and comments using the Q&A tab, and we'll try to address as many of your questions as we can at the end of the demo today. When a question is added in that Q&A panel, you can upvote the question to increase its position on my list by clicking a thumbs up button underneath it. This is always helpful so I know which questions to address first. You can also explore some links and documents in the handouts tab to learn more. And lastly, if you're having technical issues, please try to refresh your browser and ensure that you're using Google Chrome to access this event as it is the most stable browser. If you're still having trouble after you refresh, you can use the private chat function to communicate with me by sending a chat to Sydney and I'll help you to troubleshoot. And now I'm pleased to welcome Kathy to the floor. Hi, Kathy. Please take Hi. it away. Hi, thank you for that introduction and thank you all for coming today. Uh, as Sydney mentioned, today we will be briefly going over some information on warming practices with a focus on how Kent Scientific's far infrared warming systems can improve overall warming outcomes. Uh, my senior pug in that lower left hand corner of the screen might be able to get wrapped in a blanket and cuddle up to me for warmth, but that probably isn't a option for your animals. So before we start, I actually wanted to launch a quick poll to see who all is here and what your respective backgrounds are. So uh, we are going to find out who uses warming all the time, most of the time, every now and then, or not at all. And this will be open uh, during the entire presentation. So uh, I will go ahead and leave that up, give you a few minutes to answer. So it does look like we are usually using warming. Um, a little under half of y'all are answering you always use warming and a little under half are sometimes. So that is great to hear. Perfect audience for a warming talk. Before I go into detail on different warming methods, I'd like to give some brief detail on warming considerations. We always give the caveat to check with your experiment and your institution before making any decisions, especially as different species are going to have different warming needs. Ectothermic animals, endothermic animals, adult animals, neonates, and um, non-terrestrial mammals such as zebrafish are all going to have different intrinsic warming needs. Strain can also affect an animal's heating needs. A C57 mouse and a nude mouse are both going to need to maintain a 37 degree core temperature, but external conditions might affect that nude mouse more. Similarly, I may need to provide an awake animal with a different heat source to prevent hypothermia. Uh, for example, if I just performed a water maze or for swim test, the animal may need a warm zone, but I might not need to monitor its core temperature. Going forward, we're going to make a few assumptions. We are going to focus on small non-flying mammals, such as mice or rats, as well as these animals under surgical conditions. So when you're under a surgical condition, all anesthetic is going to induce hypothermia to some extent. It's going to be easier to mitigate in some anesthetics than others, but all of them are going to introduce hypothermia. Uh, these data on the right were collected from guinea pigs given a ketamine xylene cocktail. Uh, if you want to see that paper, it is in your handouts uh, for more information. During the study, hypothermia started to set in in as little as 10 minutes. When we see hypothermia, we can get other physiological parameters altered 
including um, blood perfusion to the extremities, as well as partial pressure of oxygen in the blood vessels. So when you're keeping your animal warm, you are helping it to improve its physiological parameters, and it is one of the simplest ways uh, to improve surgical outcomes. There are several methods you can use to keep your animals warm and reduce the effects of anesthesia-induced hypothermia. Draping and other physical insulation can trap heat and keep an animal warm. However, different drape materials can insulate differently, and it's not always going to be the best for every procedure, depending on what you need it draped and what you need opened. So how can we apply an external source of heat to the animals to help maintain their core temperature? Most typically, this is going to be something like a hand warmer, some sort of electric heating pad, a warm water recirculating pump, or a infrared heating source. Before I go into more detail about the different warming methods, I did want to give a quick PSA about burn risk. Some heating methods are going to be intrinsically more risky than others. When I'm discussing them, I will mention a higher or lower burn risk. No system is going to have a 0% chance of burns. If you look at instructions and user manuals for heating systems, all of them should inform you about burn risk and include ways to reduce this risk, such as not using for over 20 minutes. However, you can use a high risk system and never burn an animal as long as it's used correctly and maintained appropriately. It's a similar proof of concept to working with sharps. I'm less likely to get injured if I'm cutting away from myself using a magnet to handle a microtome blade and not recapping used needles but I have an intrinsic risk of injury solely because I'm working with sharps. You're, you are the best resource for monitoring your animals, monitoring your equipment, and making sure they stay healthy. Now that that's been said, a little more detail on the different warming methods you can use. Hand warmers are expensive, inexpensive, and easy to use. They also have a physically small footprint, which makes them great for animals such as mice, neonates, or other animals that can fit in the palm of your hand. However, larger animals such as rats or guinea pigs may not be the best size for these hand warmers. Furthermore, there is no way to really control how much heat the hand warmer is getting or how fast it is dissipating. If I stick one in the microwave, the edges might heat up faster than the center. And if I use a chemical hand warmer, I may inadvertently cause more of a reaction that generates more heat in one than the other. Because of this, they can have variable heating. With variable heating comes a higher risk of burns. A body part on this part of the hand warmer, if that part of the hand warmer is warmer, may be at a higher risk of burns than a body part on this part of the animal. Furthermore, if I use a chemical one, I might um, have heat dissipating at not quite the right speed. When that's happening, I might increase my risk of burns. Alternately, if my heat isn't dissipating at the right speed, I might need to keep replacing my hand warmer in the middle of surgery. So what are some ways we can do that are a little more consistent? To get more consistency, we start to use a electric warming component, such as an electric heating pad. Like hand warmers, they are inexpensive and easy to use. However, we don't have some of the constraints we do with hand warmers. Since you have different sizes of heating pads, you can use them with animals of different sizes. Furthermore, as long as you have a power source, they are going to warm and they're going to warm pretty evenly with no real cold spots. They also have a little more control and less variability. Um, you can switch them on or off, and some of them will have high, medium, and low heating settings. However, we still don't really see a refined temperature control. Some systems can estimate what temperatures high, medium, and low correspond to. However, if my estimate of high is around 40 degrees and my estimate of medium is around 35, my animal may be too cold on medium, but too warm on high. Similarly, if you wanna use a warming lamp instead of a warming pad, we're losing some of that heat energy to the air, so there's less control of the heat that ultimately reaches the animal. 
there is also a fairly high risk of burns. Your heating pad is constantly on and constantly delivering heat. Furthermore, this heat tends to stay at the skin surface, so you're concentrating your heat in one location. All of this together increases likelihood of burns. So what are some methods we can use where we have a control, more control of heating, but reduce our risk of burns? One of them is going to be a warm water recirculating system. When you use the warm water recirculating system, you do see a reduced risk of burns, especially since you can set a specific output temperature. These systems are also compatible with MRIs since they have um, a lower amount of metal parts. However, the system does have reduced efficiency with only about 20% of the heat generated reaching the animal and that heat energy that reaches the animal typically stops at superficial levels such as the skin. Furthermore, they require more physical space than other systems and come with specific maintenance. In order to use a warming pad, you switch it on. In order to use a warm water recirculator, you check that it has enough water, check that there are no leaks in the tubing connection or pads, make sure the tubing isn't kinked, set the temperature, set the flow rate, and clean it on a regular basis to ensure no mold or algae is growing in it. This brings us to our last warming method, something that is easy to use, takes up a low physical footprint, relatively low maintenance, and is highly efficient. Far infrared warming, um, which I will also be referring to infrared warming or FIR or fur warming, meets all of these criteria. For the remainder of the presentation, I will be sharing some more details about its benefits. First and foremost, how is infrared warming different from conventional heating? Electric heating, hand warmers, and water recirculation all utilize some sort of energy transfer between molecules. Hot molecules are going to vibrate faster and they're going to transfer that energy to cold molecules, which are vibrating slower, more vibration, more heat produced. Warm molecules are going to rise to a surface, cold are going to fall to closer to where your heating source is. That cycle continues as long as there is a heating source. However, this isn't always the most efficient form of warming since energy transfer can be lost to the environment. You also have the disadvantage of cold molecules and hot molecules needing to touch each other to transfer their energy, whether that's by direct contact or by some sort of medium such as water or air. When you use that medium, you get more energy loss and you get a less efficient heating system. Infrared warming does not need a medium. It rather directly excites water molecules to increase their temperature and cause warming. Infrared is a electromagnetic wave so it does not need that medium to transfer its energy. This results in about 90% of the energy being transferred. If I use the example of my cat in the sunbeam, only the area that is in the sunbeam is going to be warmed. So my corner of the blanket here, my air here, they aren't going to be warmed. It's just all of the instances where my sunbeam is touching. So there isn't a molecule to molecule energy transfer. It's the direct source of heating. So you get more efficient heating that uses less energy overall. And you can even get more even heat heating since you don't lose energy, for example, to a air pocket. As long as you have a source of infrared rays and as long as there are water molecules to excite, you are going to get infrared heating. Since infrared is going to excite water molecules, you not only get a reduced risk of burns, but you also get heating that can go into deeper tissues such as muscle and connective tissue. The warming does not stop superficially like in conventional heating. When you get more warming in more tissues, you also increase the metabolism of those tissues. When those tissues have their metabolism increased, you're more likely to clear your anesthetic more quickly so your animal can recover from anesthesia quicker. Furthermore, multiple studies have shown that infrared warming has various therapeutic benefits. We see infrared warming decreasing the amount of time it takes wounds to heal, as well as increasing blood flow, and also has the potential to stimulate the immune system to help clear dead and dying tissue. 
All of these together indicate that your animal may recover from the surgery more quickly when infrared warming is used. There are going to be a variety of ways you can use infrared warm it, warming. The two most common are going to be an infrared warming pad or an infrared warming lamp. Lamps are going to be a little more similar to traditional heating as some energy is going to be lost to the environment. You're also more likely to get drying of open cavities, which can result in dehydration and prolong your recovery time. When you put an animal on a infrared warming pad, you are going to get that direct contact with the infrared ray, and so you get a few more of your benefits with less of your risks. Kent Scientific offers a variety of infrared warming products ranging from our simple warming pad all the way up to a system that will allow you to monitor both pad and animal temperature at the same time and adjust the warming pad as needed. Uh, we do have a brief video that will go over some of these systems in more detail. Kent Scientific offers a range of products that provide a solution for your animal warming needs. The Right Temp product line utilizes far infrared warming, which effectively maintains the animal's body temperature while reducing the overheating risks associated with other heating methods. In most cases, some form of temperature support is required during surgical procedures. Animals can rapidly become hypothermic during surgical procedures due to the actions of the anesthetic agent, exposure of body cavities, and loss of normal thermoregulatory mechanisms and behaviors. Hypothermia can prolong recovery times and increase post-surgical mortality rates. Kent Scientific offers three unique options for integrated or standalone small animal warming for every application and price point. The far infrared warming pad controller is controlled by an adjustable power level. The percentage scale allows you to fine tune the power beyond a traditional high, medium, low scale, while the included temperature probe reports the temperature of the warming pad. The Right Temp Junior simplifies animal warming by allowing you to set a target body temperature. The included pad and animal sensors form a feedback loop that regulates the temperature of the far infrared warming pad to maintain a stable core body temperature for the animal. The Right Temp module is an advanced temperature monitoring and homeothermic warming control module that allows more customized warming control. The Right Temp module is included in the PhysioSuite Physiological Monitoring System and SomnoSuite Low Flow Electronic Anesthesia System as well as the Rovent Advanced Small Animal Ventilator and the Coda Monitor Non-Invasive Blood Pressure System. Multiple temperature display options, user settable alarms, data output, and the option to provide electrophysiology compatibility make the right temp suitable for a wide range of procedures and research protocols. To learn more about Kent Scientific's far infrared warming solutions, additional features, or to discuss which controller is best for your research, please contact your local Kent Scientific representative. One of the features I do want to give a little more detail on is the homeothermic warming system included in our Right Temp Junior systems, as well as any system that has the full Right Temp module. This will monitor both the pad and animal temperature and raise or lower the pad temperature accordingly to maintain a set core temperature. For example, if you're under a vent and the heater comes on during surgery, your animal will have some additional external heat, so the pad might not need to be as warm, and it will uh, lower the temperature of the pad accordingly. When that heater goes off and the room starts to cool a little, the pad will raise its temperature to compensate for this cooling. The full right temp module will also give you the option to control the pad temperature. For example, if you do not want it to go over a set temperature, you would be able to set it in the programming. 
To finish this off today, I have one final video with a sample protocol for using our different systems. Kent Scientific offers a range of products that provide a solution for your animal warming needs, including the Far Infrared Warming Pad Controller, the Right Temp Junior, and the integrated Right Temp Module. Each warming product includes a Far Infrared Warming Pad and temperature sensors to effectively warm the animal while monitoring temperature. The Far Infrared Warming Pad Controller is controlled by an adjustable power level. The percentage scale allows you to fine-tune the power beyond a traditional high-medium-low scale, while the included temperature probe reports the temperature of the warming pad. To set up the Far Infrared Warming Pad Controller, first connect the warming pad and the pad sensor to the back of the controller. Secure the temperature sensor to the center of the warming pad. If using tape or other protective layers, be sure there are no air bubbles trapped around the tip of the sensor. Position the anesthetized animal directly on top of the pad sensor. This placement is important for accurate pad temperature measurements. Use the pad temperature reading to determine the percent power setting that is ideal for your environment and application, ambient conditions, surface material, Animal body temperature and animal size can impact the power setting required to reach a specific pad temperature. Always monitor your animal to ensure optimal warming conditions. The Right Temp Junior simplifies animal warming by allowing you to set a target body temperature. The included pad and animal sensors form a feedback loop that regulates the temperature of the far infrared warming pad and maintains a stable core body temperature for the animal. To set up the right temp junior, first connect the warming pad and both sensors to the back of the controller. One sensor will be used to monitor pad temperature, while the other sensor will measure animal body temperature. Secure the pad sensor to the center of the warming pad. If using tape or other protective layers, be sure there are no air bubbles trapped around the tip of the sensor. Position the anesthetized animal directly on top of the pad sensor. This placement is important for accurate pad temperature measurements. Gently insert the animal sensor into the rectum of the animal, up to a depth of 2 cm. Petroleum-based lubricants can be used if desired. The Right Temp Junior will begin warming in pad power mode. Once a rise in animal body temperature is detected, it will move into regulation mode. Use the arrows to adjust the target body temperature. The right temp junior will automatically adjust to maintain the animal's temperature over the course of your procedure. The right temp module is an advanced temperature monitoring and homeothermic warming control module that allows more customized warming control. The right temp module is included in the PhysioSuite Physiological Monitoring System and SomnoSuite Low Flow Electronic Anesthesia System, as well as the Rovent Advanced Small Animal Ventilator and the Coda Monitor Non Invasive Blood Pressure System. To set up the right temp module, first connect the warming pad and both sensors to the front connections on the system controller. One sensor will be used to monitor pad temperature while the other sensor will measure animal body temperature. Secure the pad sensor to the center of the warming pad. If using tape or other protective layers, be sure there are no air bubbles trapped around the tip of the sensor. To enable warming, touch Setup, then Control Warming. There are two warming control options. Warming Pad Mode allows you to set a power percentage to the warming pad while monitoring pad temperature and homeothermic mode allows you to set a target animal body temperature. Position the anesthetized animal directly on top of the pad sensor. This placement is important for accurate pad temperature measurements. To measure animal body temperature, gently insert the animal sensor into the rectum of the animal up to a depth of 2 cm. Petroleum-based lubricants can be used if desired. The right temp module will begin warming in pad power mode. Once a rise in animal body temperature is detected, it will move into homeothermic mode. Use the plus and minus icons to adjust the target body temperature if needed. 
The right tip will automatically adjust to maintain the animal's temperature over the course of your procedure. To learn more about Kent Scientific's Far Infrared Warming products, additional features, or to discuss which controller is best for your research, please contact your local Kent Scientific representative. All right, so I, I would like to take one more opportunity to thank everyone for coming and you get one final picture of my pug wrapped up in a blanket because she likes being warm. Uh, I believe we have some polls before starting the Q&A session. Uh, I am also leaving my contact information up here in case you do have any questions that we don't get to during the session. Uh, Sydney, uh, you can launch the polls and start the Q&A whenever you're ready. Thank you for the fantastic demo, Kathy. Um, I'm actually going to give you a second to catch your breath, maybe some, some water. <laughs> so I'll give you a moment there before we bring you back on. <clears throat> and as Kathy mentioned, I'm going to launch some polls and I just wanna remind you too, to submit those questions in the Q&A tab. Um, so we're gonna have a really exciting Q&A session. We'd love to hear from you. So put all your questions in there now. All right, our first poll for the session, this part of the session, what type of warming system is typically used? This is a multi-select, so you can select more than one. Um, your options are some of the ones that Kathy went over, so hand warmers, electronic heating pad, electronic heating lamp, an infrared heating pad, an infrared heating lamp, a wa warm water recirculator, or not applicable if you're not using these. So please let us know what you typically use. And while you're answering that, I did wanna draw your attention to the handouts tab. There are some great resources in there that will help you learn more about the warming systems Kathy presented today, as well as a couple of papers. Okay, that's great. Looks like quite a good distribution of different systems. All right, um, and the last poll for today, which of these features is mo most important to you? This is also a multi-select. So um, is it therapeutic value, reduced instances of burns, core warming instead of surface warming, or increased metabolism? So you can go ahead and let us know and I'll give everyone a few seconds to answer that before uh, we jump into our Q&A session. And lastly, if you have to leave early, I do just wanna pop up this uh, link to our post webinar survey. So if you could please take a moment to provide your feedback here before you go, uh, we really appreciate your insights. The survey will also appear um, at the very end of the webinar if you'd like to wait to do that. So thank you very much. And yeah, it looks like we've got a good distribution for uh, this poll as well with majority interested in core warming instead of surface warming. So that's great. All right, we have uh, some questions coming in. Thank you, continue to submit those. And I'm gonna bring Kathy back on now to start our session. Hello again. Hello. It looks like we have some good ones coming in. Yeah. So let me just quickly look through these. Okay. All right. So the first one that we'll address, do you have any recommendations or solutions to supply control and or regulate heat during surgical recovery? Okay, so this is during recovery, not when your animals are actually being anesthetized. Um, for using the infrared systems, one of the easiest thing to do is just keep your animal um, on the pad until they've sort of woken up from anesthesia. You, you would obviously remove your rectal probe, but as long as they are on top of the sensor, they will see some warming. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Um, 
can you share with us the oh sorry the the question jumped around can you share with us the sanitation process recommended for the products um uh, that you shared with us today? So sanitation, the controllers, you're going to want to treat like any um, piece of electrical uh, equipment you're bringing into the facility, such as a laptop. Generally, wiping them down with 70% ethanol or something similar is going to be sufficient. Uh, you, I believe you can use vaporized hydrogen peroxide on them as well. For the pads, we do offer a option of disposable plastic covers so you would put a new one on for every use and then dispose of it um, it would be something similar where you would want to use a 70 percent ethanol or similar to wipe it down if you are not using that cover um, not machine washable they do have a metal component so i would recommend surface cleaning only okay thank you um do you have any options or any plans that you know of for neonatal mouse warming so or any recommendations for that? Uh, I will pass it on to our R&D team. There's nothing I'm immediately aware of specific for neonatal mouse, mice. However, we do kind of have a workaround in homeothermic mode. You would just put your animal sensor next to your pad sensor and have your animal on top of both. So if you don't want to use a rectal sensor for whatever reason, such as neonatal animals, you would just put them on top of both sensors and it's sort of a workaround for the homeothermic. Great. Yeah. And you can reach out directly to Kathy too, and she'd be more than happy, yep. I'm sure, to help yeah, absolutely. You with your specific setup. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Can you share, uh, I don't think I asked this one yet. Can you share with us the sanitation process recommended for the products that you shared with us? Uh, so uh, controllers are going, and I think we actually have this in the frequently asked questions on our website. So if you have any other follow-ups, you can check there or shoot me an email. Um, treat them like you would any other electronic. So with the controllers, it would be wiping them down with ethanol or something similar. Uh, you can use vaporized hydrogen peroxide if you have a specific sanitation um, question, feel free to email us like, hey, this is what I use. Is it okay? We will be more than happy to answer. Um, the pads themselves do have a metal component. They have wires, so they're not going to be machine washable, but we can provide you with a disposable plastic cover that you can slip the pad into and then just use a new one for every surgery. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. When presented with an unknown heating pad in a facility, how can you tell if it's heating, uh, if the pad is electrical or infrared? Do you that know? is a great question. And this might not be the greatest answer because the best way to tell is to actually look at the user manual and see if it tells you if it's infrared or electric. Um, a lot of the times there aren't a lot of super obvious differences. So if I pulled out my demo electric, my demo infrared pad and the electric warming pad I have from Walmart for um, muscle pain, just looking at them on the surface, there might not be any obvious differences. So the best way to do that is really consult with your fact, with your facility, double check um, if they can provide you with a manufacturer and look at the alternate resources. If you're just looking at it on face value, there might not be a good way to confirm if it's infrared or electric. Okay, yes, that makes sense. Okay, uh, are the temperature probes calibrated? So long story short, they don't need to be because of how the system, um, main, the system maintains its temperature. If you shoot us an email, that's a little bit of a longer <laughs> explanation, but we will be more than happy to provide you with the longer explanation. Perfect. Okay. What wavelengths of infrared light does the system use to heat? Great question. I actually do not know the answer to that one. No problem. I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that might be a, a specific like, question. Yeah, like I said, I can look that up for you. So if you do have that question, again, I'm pretty responsive to email and it might, it's, if it's something we can look up, it's just something we need to look up. Perfect. Okay. Um, 
somebody is asking for a bit of advice. What should you do if the infrared heating pad is working properly, but the core temp of the mouse is still not maintaining 37 mm -hmm. degrees? So the first thing I would do in that case, double check that your sensors are actually working. So sometimes you can get a um, wire loose in the temperature probe. Easiest way to check if it's reading is to take the tip in your fingers, you should see a temperature change. It might not get all the way up to physiological core temperature, especially if your knee and your hands are always cold, but you should see a change in breathing. If you're not seeing that change in breathing, you may have a broken probe and you would need to replace it. Um, alternately, I would double check where your sensor placement actually is. So the way infrared works, like I said, you need water molecules to excite and you don't want any air bubbles. So if you have your sensor probe tip and you have lab tape over it, that lab tape can sometimes create an air bubble where your sensor might not be reading the right temperature. So your pad is getting warm, but it might not be enough warming for your animal. Uh, so you're doing that, that's fine. Make sure the bulkiest part of your animal, so typically the abdominal region is on top of that sensor. That will help make sure there is um, water molecule for the pad to actually heat. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully that helps. Um, okay. The next question is whether there's routine maintenance recommended for the infrared system. So again, we kind of touched on mm -hmm. calibration, but mm -hmm. uh, do you have any other uh, maintenance that's needed no. for it? We don't really recommend any routine maintenance. Um, like I said, you might want to check that your sensors are working before using your system, because if your sensor is broken, you're not going to see the correct temperature reported. But other than that, there is no routine maintenance. Okay, great. Um, are there different size pads available? And is there anything mm -hmm. that would work best specifically for a stereotaxic frame? Mm -hmm. So I am going to talk a little bit more about the stereotaxic one. Um, the sizes, they're on our website. I can't remember the exact ones off the top of my head, but we do have a smaller one and a larger one. Smaller one is going to be more appropriate for mice, larger, more appropriate for rats. Mm -hmm. Stereotaxic, you sometimes need setup modifications. Um, if you need a riser to make sure your animal is in sufficient contact with the warming pad, make sure that is a non-porous material such as a metal. If you're using something that is porous or has any insulation uh, like styrofoam, that might cause your heating element to uh, not work quite correctly because the material is absorbing some heat. So it winds up your system isn't reporting the right temperature. All right. Um, and on that same train of thought, uh, are there options from Kent that are MR compatible or if not, um, mm -hmm. what would you recommend? So um, uh, MRI compatibility, the infrared warming pads, they do have a metal component. So you are not going to want to use them in an MRI. For an MRI, the only thing uh, Kent offers that is compatible is going to be a warm water recirculating pump. Okay, that makes sense. That's great. Um, let's see, are the pads available in a hard version? I think, cause I think they're a yeah. little softer. Yeah, so kind of, we do have a hard warming platform that we typically provide with our high throughput CODA system. Um, pretty much you would put the animal on the platform and then the platform uses infrared warming. So it's not a pad, but it is a hard infrared warming surface. Okay, great. Can you share whether there are options for therapeutic warming of shoebox caging? So we do not provide um, infrared warming option for shoebox caging for something like that. You might be able to use a infrared heat lamp, um, especially because I'm presuming if your animals are in shoebox caging, they are conscious and they are going to be able to regulate their own body heat. So you might not want a warming pad with no cool zone, just in case they're starting to get a little warm in one zone, they can move away from it and continue to thermally regulate. So for something like that, I would look into infrared warming lamp options. That's a great solution. Thank yeah. you. 
Um, just want to remind everyone, please submit your questions. We still have a couple of minutes. If you have any more questions, um, we can answer those. Uh, there is a question I wanted to ask first, whether you know any, about delta phase isothermal pads. Before yeah, that is, that is, <laughs> that is definitely <laughs> outside of my, my level okay. of expertise. <laughs> no worries. So um, yes, for that question, yeah. I would recommend emailing probably support or Kathy and she can find yeah. the right person to get in touch with. <laughs> um, yeah, but... Let's see if any last questions roll through. Otherwise, we will finish the, the demo here. Do you have any last comments that came to mind from these questions that you'd like to share? Ooh, that's a great one. Nothing that is immediately coming up. Like I said, they've been a lot of great questions. Mm -hmm. OK, great. I think in this case, we will end it here then. Make sure to make a note of uh, Kathy's email and the support email from Kent. If you have any questions that you think of when we end here or you'd like to get in touch with them to um, ask any specific questions about your lab and your setup, feel free to reach out to them. You can also give them a call. Um, okay, we did have one last question oh, come in. Yay, I always love the last one. <laughs> can you tailor the physio suite? It depends on what you mean by tailoring. Uh, if you reach out to support or your sales representative, we will give you the options you can use to tailor it. Perfect. Yeah. All right. Okay, Kathy, thank you so much for your time right. today. Thank you that for having was, me. Yeah, that was a really great presentation and um, the videos as well were very helpful. So um, yeah, thank you very much and I hope you enjoyed yourself. All right. Thank you. Great. All right. Have a lovely rest of your days, everyone. Thanks. I also want to thank you, our live audience. We know we have busy schedules, so we really appreciate you being here, and I hope that you enjoyed your experience today. In closing, we hope you enjoyed this Inside Scientific virtual demo produced in partnership with Kent Scientific, and I hope that you enjoy the rest of your day.